I heard that he was going to ride uh, the length of the Great Wall of China, I just, I, you know, I, I thought he was crazy. I mean, yeah, wouldn't it be cool to ride the Great Wall of China? It's this crazy, it's never going to happen, you know, he's dreaming. The, I mean, just the Great Wall itself is a World Heritage Monument, but it's something that's also represent the history of China in a place that was, you know, foreign to, to most people. And uh, it's kind of a pioneer. It's, it's a kind of a, yeah, pioneer. Yeah, that's what I would say. But he's, he's not looking for fame. He's just looking to be unique, be Kevin. And, and I don't know that anybody really knows what that is. When I hear the name Kevin Foster, I think about a student who was uh, curious Artist, eccentric, uh, out there, in a good way. I believe Kevin was born, uh, come out of the womb with his middle finger up. Captain America. A big time adventurer. Someone who is a dreamer. Someone who defies limits. Crazy mountaineer on a bike. And it was, he was dared to be different, I would say. Kevin was always a dreamer. He's uh, tenacious like a pit bull. Of a free thinker who also gets things done. Fearless. And, uh, Kevin has, has been a guy who pushed the envelope of what you can do with a bike. In a sense, he is, in a positive sense, relentless. Um, engaging and gregarious. He's very chatty. What's well, a nice way of saying pushy? He I'm going to try to make the summit. Hey, I may be arrested. Taking bets as to how long it would take before they drag him off and put him in a cell. Uh, off the record, I want to be. Well, you know, one time I thought he was a nut. Uh, the helicopter you saw, it landed on the other side, and hey, we may meet some of the boys. He is not the first row in any academic setting. That's not where you're going to find Kevin. Kevin, you're going to get us killed. Will you stop this? But I would make a suggestion that we rarely find our heroes in the very first row of any classroom. The highest natural point in the continental United States. If you have a dream and you have a goal, there are lots of obstacles, there are a lot of walls to break down to get to your dream. And this, this wall is a great wall and it, it signifies um, a tremendous uh, obstacle. You know, I come from a family of immigrants. I'm the first generation born American. No handouts. I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. I had gotten into an accident when I was about eight years old and I was electrocuted. I said, let's race to the top of the tree. And as you can see, there are four wires here. Got the last branch and I grabbed, it created a circuit that went through the course of my body and came out in various parts of my body. And now I start falling like a ping pong ball. I did whatever I had to do to get across. I crashed through the front door. I let out a scream. All the flesh was gone down to the bone. I, I, I'm just in shock. 30 amps, 65,000 volts of electricity? Doesn't happen, you don't live to talk about it. At that point, the doctors determined he, his brain probably isn't gonna turn back on. They told me that there was absolutely no hope. Kevin's father's reaction was, we have to institutionalize him to his own son, flesh and blood. You, you, you can turn your back and say, there's nothing else. I had never met such a heartless person. He was gonna be confined to an institution for the rest of his life. And my answer to that was, that will never happen. And once my brain clicked back on, I was able to absorb a lot of stuff. Then the time came toward the end of the summer when this doctor came in and this woman that's been coming to see you, she's your mother. You, you are her son. This is your father. I'm like, okay. The part about his memory being erased how could he relate to me if he doesn't even know who I am? But he felt when he looked at me, who's this stranger? Out of my four children, he is the only one that calls me mother. Why do they call me mom? You call me mother. That's a title for you. 
It doesn't mean that we're connected as mother and son. I don't know what happened before the accident. I have no idea. I have seen pictures. That is me, or was me, but it's not me. I'm a different me now. Whereas my father would come home, you know, maybe play with his other children, but I was never involved in that. So that was kind of like almost like punishment, but I didn't know who he was anyway, so. He's the only one he used to beat all the time. So if I were to come out and say, you know, dad was an evil man, they're not gonna see it because what happened to me didn't happen to them. Now my father beat me with a belt and he punched me. And when I say beating, I don't mean a little slap on the behind or something. I mean, he used to torture him. I would work at my therapy harder. I would do it longer. I don't care. I want out of this thing. And relearn everything. The doctor said I will never get out of a wheelchair. And so I had to have therapy and I was able to get out of a wheelchair and back on a bicycle within four years. Can't talk or feed yourself or you're in a wheelchair and suddenly you go on a bike with training wheels. You're making progress, so he accepted that, that he's getting better. Because of the electrocution, my heart didn't develop. And so I always had the heart of an eight-year-old. The University of Connecticut Medical Center decided, hey, we'd like to study you. Well, the worst kind of exercise would be isometric exercise, anything that makes the blood pressure go up. So I always kind of called myself a guinea pig uh, during those 12 years. You know, maybe he was told he would never walk again or run again. Uh, I think that shaped his value, his determination, uh, his personality more than anything else. I think what drove Kevin initially and kept driving him through his life was climbing out of that wheelchair. She had a lot of dreams, but again, she never had the discipline for those dreams to go after them. Her dreams would come out of books. And back in the day, back in the 60s and 70s, almost every family bought a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas. And that was my mother's library. When she had that moment, she can pull out one of those volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and she can read about these countries and about these people and about these events, and she could feel like she's been there. And then it was time to put us to bed, and so she would say that the bed is a giant envelope, and it's time to go into the envelope to send you away. And so I get in, and she'd have the sheet like up to here, up to the neck. And she'd sit beside my bed. She'd look at me and she'd say, okay, what country do you want to visit tonight? It could be China, it could be Africa. Sometimes she would suggest it because of something she just read. Oh, I got a country picked out tonight. Here's the country you're going to go tonight to. And she would tell me about the people. And oh, this place, and oh, they have this and this and oh, this, and she, you know, the colors, and, and she'd just talk about the country and the place where it was located in the world until I went to sleep. So this was kind of like a nightly ritual. And that began my love of adventure. I, I don't understand the connection, but I, I give you the title of mother and I honor you as, as a mother for not just giving me life once, but you gave me life twice. I just thought that once I got out of the wheelchair, that I just wanted to do something so incredible. I, re I wanted to mark my stamp. In social studies, and we just happened to be working with China at the same time that President Nixon made his trip. And I said, what a beautiful opportunity for the kids to see the tie-in between what they're learning in a book and what's really happening in the world. Tonight I want all of you to go home and watch the news. And then tomorrow I want you to give an oral report. They, they all were excited about that. You know, the homework assignment was to watch TV. My hope is that in the future, perhaps as a result of uh, the beginning that we have made on this journey that many, many Americans, particularly the young Americans who like to travel so much, 
will have an opportunity to come here as I have come here today, that they will be able to see this wall, uh, that they will think back as I think back to the history of this great people. But when I saw the Great Wall of China, I had that epiphany, like, man, I want to do this. Because at that point, I was back on a bicycle with training wheels. He took one look and said, I'm riding my bike on that wall. Well, when they came in the next day, of course, I'm going to follow up. And I said, wow, I, the Great Wall of China, I love the Great Wall of China. I, I'm going to ride my bicycle on it someday. Well, that's, that's quite a dream to, to share with your, with your fellow students, so... Uh, of course, some of them laughed. The laughter started. You know, one kid, two kids, it all started laughing. And that was the first time I was actually laughed at. But everybody, and then the bully started, and then the taunting started at recess. Uh, a homework assignment and came up with uh, a personal goal from it. I think that's terrific. Uh, Chairman Mao's, if a man fails to reach the end of the wall, he's not a true man drove me, that was my mantra, that I was, I was going to finish, that I can get to the end of the wall, or I was going to die trying. If I can cycle the Great Wall of China and live, I'll never go back to that wheelchair again. In between this dream of wanting to cycle the Great Wall, I, I was going after an acting career. This was the first time that I ever experienced getting paid for something that I would normally do for free. And I liked it. So I talked to my father, and man, he blew a gasket. And he said, absolutely not. I'm telling you something, all actors are bums, and I will not have a bum for a son. I mean, his father thought a lot about money. I mean, Kevin, he'd give you the dollar that was in his pocket. You know, they had a lot of harsh words. You know, his father was very hard on him. Acting was fun, but it wasn't about the money. It was about traveling, you know, getting out of the house, getting away from the family. I mean, right now, I got a shelf full of dreams and an empty shelf of realities. When I'm an old man, I want to be able to look back and see an empty shelf of dreams and a full shelf of realities. And believe it or not. He graduated high school, and then he went to New York City. He did his craft. He was on Broadway. Moving up and getting my formal training uh, in New York and, and then, you know, after summer stock and dinner theater and then getting small parts in, in films. Getting to go to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, you know, you think about all the actors that came out of there. I thought he had terrific potential for that. But obviously he had greater potential for something else and I was glad to see that he uh, was able to maximize it. Actor training really gets you in touch with yourself. And so I think that when, when students leave the academy, they know who they are. I had been, at that point, studying the Great Wall of China as much as I could from one end to the other. I was studying it for 18 years. And I heard this little voice in my head that said, well, if you could do anything you wanted right now, anything, like what would you want to do right now? I'd really like to cycle the Great Wall of China. And I wrote to Nixon and Mao and so on and so forth through the last 18 years. I, I couldn't do it last year, so I decided to spend 85 hours on the New York subway system, which gave me the Guinness record. And I got so much publicity out of that that I got the China trip. I actually heard about it on the radio, and I said, I know that guy. <laughs> Gavin Foster set a world's record last year for spending most time underground riding the subways on only one token. He also proved himself at that moment you know what, you know, this guy really can create some publicity and value for his sponsors. I, mean, I held that record for 21 years. Oh, yes? Uh, six, co six college students and a laptop beat. <laughs> so, no, I mean, I don't know what it is about Kevin that makes it all happen. It just happens. Because of my connections with Chris Dodd and National Geographic, I asked them to write letters of recommendation for me to cycle the Great Wall, and they did, and that's what got me through the door with the Chinese government. Permission to become the first person to ride on top of it. It's, it's just a matter of time if you're riding around the city and I got hit by a truck. I was laid up for six weeks with a concussion. One of the cycling coaches for the U.S. Olympic team uh, heard about the story and he thought, this guy needs some training. 
22 years ago, Kevin was nearly electrocuted on a journey that until now he could only imagine. Really? China? And you're going to ride your bike on the whole wall? When it was announced, it was something else. It was mind-boggling that uh, not only politically could it be pulled off, uh, but physically and solo. This is, this is really going to make history. One of the other titles that they mentioned in the press is that I was an extreme cyclist. And I'm saying, what's, his, what's an extreme cyclist? And they said, you. I didn't think of it that way. I thought of it as exploring. You have no idea how big it is, how old it is, how complicated it is. I'm not sure that I can have any emotion except for awe. But then to meet all the people, to have all the experiences, all that that goes with, it was just this kind of quintessential mountain bike adventure moment. I was really jealous. <laughs> at this tour, at this Great Wall Tour, as uh, something that can unite China and the United States together in peace and friendship. Of the first uh, U.S.-China joint expedition to ride bicycles on top of the Great Wall. It's a section which is about four miles paved that people go walking on. So right. that, that'll out be of, easy. Out of four miles, out of 2,300 will be my easiest section. Mm -hmm. I will cover a distance of approximately 2,000 miles at altitudes that range from 16,000 feet at the start of the trek all the way to down around sea level at the end. The 130 degree heat in the Gobi Desert and then dust storms, rainstorms, uh, a hailstorm. I got to see a village when I got caught in a flash flood and went through it. Uh, fell through the wall a couple of times, cracked a rib, uh, heat stroke, uh, dehydration. I've been at this since mid-April and we expect to finish the wall sometime in July. That's just the kind of guy he is. He's always got an agenda, and he's always moving toward that agenda. Um, and I, I, the people like that fascinate me because I'm kind of the total opposite and I just sort of, sometimes I wish I could be that way, but I'm just not. <laughs> I wasn't training to a point of like racing people. I was never trying to beat the competition. I was trying to beat the elements. Will and determination and, and grit and uh, you'll do it. You know, and I beat my body up at that time. That's why I know today, I couldn't do the Great Wall today. It'd kill me today. Uh, but back then, and it almost killed me then. But. Um, uh, I was tired, I was hurting, I had three cracked ribs, my shoulders were sore. Um, I wanted this over with. Uh, I, I was actually happy to see the, you know, the Sea of Baha'i. Uh, the, the Great Wall is a, is a monument to human you know, architecture and, and might and powers. To, to ride a bike nearly 2,000 miles to get permission to do it, to, to break down barriers or at least begin to build the bridge between the two nations. Because let's face it, the United States and China in the, in the next 50 years are going to be, are, are clearly even now, the great powers of the world. And I intend to go all the way to the shore on this and uh, to once and for all conquer the Great Wall. And if this can be conquered, then other people who have dreams can conquer their walls. So as I say, go after your dream, let no wall stand in your way. I've been a part of this wall. We've, we've been a part of this wall for the last five weeks. And it took 18 years to get to this point. In a matter of two weeks, it'll all be over. And uh, it's been the most, uh, the most incredible experience I've ever had or will ever have and for the rest of my life, any time that I see photos of this wall, it'll be different because I'll be saying, I was on that wall, I rode that wall. My recollection is, is that we, we were all out, uh, I, I think, at, at a local pub and someone had said, oh, did you all know that Kevin actually completed this. Like, he really did this, he really finished. 
got to be kidding me. Crazy Kevin really did this? And yeah, he really did. And it was really inspiring. It was really something. This was before, you know, any of the social media. And uh, I was really happy for him and I saw the photo of him holding the, up the bike and I felt like part of me was in that photo. <laughs> Uh, to have somebody make an impact not only on their individuality but also make an impact uh, nationally and internationally that's that's quite a thing that does that doesn't happen to uh, to just anybody and when i found out that uh, i had something to do with it uh, there's a certain pride that teachers get when something like that uh, when they find out about it so very special My suspicion is if there's going to be any lasting memory, memorial, if you will, to Kevin Foster, it's, it's the Great Wall of China. To uh, finally, with a lot of persistence and a lot of hard work, to be able to see my dream come true. One is for peace and friendship uh, between our two countries, between the U.S. and China. It was done, the dream was over. But my father couldn't handle it. He's half a world away, back in Connecticut in his office. He's going in his office, he has the radio on, they break, news. The first person who cycled the Great Wall of China, blah, blah, blah. He couldn't stand it. That afternoon, he picks up the newspaper. Boom, there I am on the front page of the hometown paper. He's getting some dinner, he's turning on the news. There I am on TV and he couldn't stand it, he just goes nuts. What is with this guy? Kevin just returned from China where he spent the last five and a half weeks bicycling along the Great Wall. There were some life-threatening moments, but now there's only one thing on Kevin's mind. Uh, let me see, I want a burrito, I want McDonald's, I want pizza, I, I want a week's worth of junk food. And then that was at that point I was saying, where can you take this bike? And how can we do something with this bike to inspire others to explore their world. And at the time, there were no X Games. You know, jump, jumping off a house roof or something, that was crazy, you know. Uh, but, but then at that time, I was considered crazy. When Kevin won the Cyclist of the Year Award in 1990, ahead of Greg LeMond, it was uh, a signal to the company at Cannondale that this was, this was a person who was for real. He says, guess what, you just got the Cyclist of the Year award. And I said, really? You're kidding me. You know, Greg Lamont, he just won his third Tour de France this year. I mean, everybody, when they announced that and it came out, people were like, who? Who? Uh, I never won anything in my life. And for them, it was quite an honor to make my dream come true. Kevin riding the Great Wall of China, when he did, it was not just a bike ride, it was an adventure, and it was a challenge, and it was, I've seen, I haven't been to the Great Wall, but I've seen what it's like and the conditions, and it's, it's Perry Bay a hundred times over. I know that he could say he suffered, but it's a good suffering because when you have an adventure, there's a discovery part of it that is really, that's part of cycling. So it's really cool he did, but I also say he's really lucky he did it when he did, just like to be that first guy to do that. That's really a cool, cool thing to have in your life. You know, he had a dream and, 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 and he, you know, he did it. I had, I had some doubts, you know, until until he did it, and that, uh, you know, just made me believe he could do everything else uh, that he talked about doing in his life. There's the Kevin Foster I love. Kevin Foster, who gained international attention when he bicycled the length of the Great Wall of China, has set out on another challenge. The 1990 Cyclist of the Year is planning to get a bicycle to the highest point in each of the 50 states. That's some 12,000 feet up there, as you can see. Who, who would even think of riding a bicycle or carrying a bicycle to the summit of all 50 states? My acting career just slipped away, and my cycling career began in the 90s, began as the adventure cyclist. and Go down the road and see what other mischief we can find. There were some real risks there. There were some real dangers, definitely dangers waiting for him there. 
right there. That's Chicken Ridge. On many of those summits, he carried his bike up the hill. He broke the bike down and carried it in a backpack. But he was still standing on that summit with a bicycle. It's just everything is full of dirt. Well, you know, you're at 10,000 feet. It does strange things to you. OK, oh, there's the bike. I want to show you the edge. You want to see the edge? Ooh, you're going to love this. Here we go. Here we go. We're going over. Ah! But Kevin went through unbelievable challenge to get that get his bike to the top of those states. So we're heading in. The getting up part, I was pretty impressed with. This. That's the highest because this rock is the highest. I don't know. He rode down almost all that too. And some of the places he rode down were beyond extreme. miles of downhill. On the bikes he was doing it on, that was sheer talent. My last one, my last high downhill was 41 and a half miles an hour. You remember that that, that was the Chia Mountain in, in uh, Alabama last year. This one, I love this bike. 52 miles an hour. Some of them were so beyond what the average cyclist could even dream of doing that it was out of the realm of thinking about it. See if we can get a close up. You see the van? There you go. There she is. And then, you know, from, from this, the X Games came out and... Uh... Now, as that envelope's been pushed by people like Kevin, extreme sports are part of our culture. And it was fun to watch, to see the different ones, because he was, you know, it's the easy ones he go, you know. But the hard ones, and there are a lot of them, I mean, that took a lot. You can see the top where we're going. I'll show you the top, okay? See, right there. There we go. That's it. And of course, I'm thinking about Denali when he was up on the top of Denali. I can't even imagine what that was like. That's right. This is all the stuff that one person needs to take to have a somewhat comfortable trip up Denali. I mean, where did you think of this, Kevin? This kind of what I thought of. Like, what great stories that, to even begin to think of something like that. This has been bad. We've been trapped up here seven, for seven days. Minus 72 below zero, 75 of us. Three have already died. We don't even know who's going to be next. Harrowing experience. I thought I was going to lose my life. One of the iconic images of the last century is Kevin on top of Mount McKinley, holding that bike over his head. It reminds me of like uh, holding a sleigh filled with toys on top of Mount Crumpet. Completion of a dream fulfilled. Well done. There we are. There she is, the beast. Who would dream of? Going to Cuba, El Presidente, welcoming him to Cuba. You know, are all just great examples of ideas that nobody else really had. This guy gets an idea and he goes out and really makes it happen. There's really a lesson there for all of us. Out of anything else I do, whether, you know, I did American Summits, I did Cuba, and I had those bicycles, it doesn't matter. This one, this is it. This is the bike that cycled the Great Wall of China. When I was ready to go to Cuba, it was in the news that I received an invitation from Fidel Castro. My father was strange because you could never go see him. You had to make an appointment with a secretary. You're going to Cuba? Yes. Embarrassing the family name. 
After all this time, you still won't learn. I have had it with you. You are an embarrassment to this family. You are dead from here on in. I cut you from my will. I never want to hear, see, or speak to you ever again. We just flew in. Can we come and see you? You'll never come and see me. You're dead to me. You know, looking back, you know, I'm kind of sorry. I blew my top. And who knew this was going to be the last time we would ever speak to one another. And this is uh, October of 1997. But, I mean, you know, enough is enough. I mean, I've been taking this all my life. I've been taking the beatings and the punchings and the, the words, you know, you're a bum, you're a loser, uh, you're never going to make anything of yourself, you're an embarrassment to the family, and you just keep going and you take it and you take it and you take it. I'm, I'm doing my life. Guess what? I made it. Guess what? Your mother lied to you. All right? You didn't go after your dreams because you were afraid. I have elevated the family name, and don't you ever forget that. And then, of course, he hung up on me, and that was it. And that was 1997. He died 2012. For the last 15 years of his life, he, had, he still had this incredible hatred for me. Even when he knew he was going to die, it was over. He, he died of cancer of the bones, and, and my sister is crying, and she's saying, Dad, before you die, you have to reconcile with Kevin. He would be lying there, lying there on his deathbed, saying, shut up, shut up, I don't want to hear about him. Your brother is a worthless bum who never worked a day in his life, and I will never apologize to him for, for the embarrassment that he has caused his family. And then shortly after that, he slipped into a coma, and two days later, he was dead. And that was it. I think because of where he came from, or maybe his parents' situation, or the fact of him being electrocuted years ago, uh, that he felt he had to prove himself, prove himself, prove himself, prove himself, prove himself, and now he's done that, and uh, now sort of relax and not feel that he has to prove himself to everybody. He seemed, I think, at peace and satisfied with himself. Having a goal, and that's what I want to do. Now, what do I need to do to get there? Now, that part of Kevin, I understand. This is what I call home, place in the mountains. The least amount of time I have to spend in the city, the better for me. This is the place where I can formulate my dreams, think about how I'm going to turn them into reality, He's the kind that uh, he can do when other people say you can't. So nowadays when people say, you can't do that, I go, watch me. Dad took the picture and I sent it to him and I wrote that across it. I don't know, it, when I think about it now, I don't know if that was probably the best term, but there were so many people not believing in him. You know, even dreamers get discouraged. You, at some point, just want to end it all. And a friend sent me a, a clip uh, of the Great Wall of China. She wrote on it, go for it, to where she was able to pull me out of the abyss. And I never told her up until now that those words and that act helped to save my life. Wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Sometimes you don't know how much of an impact. I know we were close. I didn't realize what's such an impact. M maybe because I believed in him and truly believed in him. When they see someone that has lived and, and achieved what he has achieved, they see that it's possible for them. So that's the best thing that you can do is give back. And so the way I got to travel and to do the, the adventures, the key theme was the bicycle. So without the bicycle, I mean, the bicycle is what made me who I am today. The bicycle is what gave me the life that I have today. Make no mistake, there were plenty of us who thought he was nuts. And uh, he proved us all wrong. It's still one of the cooler things that I've ever known anyone to ever do.
I guess he did dream smart because he pulled it off. I like to chide him a little bit because his one goal that he kept telling me over and over again was to be the first person to ride a bike on the moon. Mars is now in his vocabulary as much as a young man who endured a terrible, terrible injury. You know, forget Great Wall of China for a moment, forget Cuba, forget the, the, the summits, and think about someone who climbed up out of a wheelchair. I, so all of his, you know, entertainment uh, escapades is, are, are wonderful, but he is an, ad, an adventure seeker at heart. He's looking for the next frontier. I, I hope he finds one more because he's, he's completed some of the most remarkable that I've ever known. Because whoever he has become now, he's still my child. And I'm the mother forever until one of us goes. My mother never had an adventure in her life. And so as I was wrapping up her, her estate, and once I received the ashes, I actually placed my mother in several envelopes and got a map of the world and said, um, okay, and a, and a couple of years after she died, I was able to go to Ecuador and stand on the equator. And I thought how perfect it would be to spread some of her ashes across both hemispheres of the equator. And so that's one adventure. And I have other spots in the world that I've chosen for her. And when those opportunities come up, I will take her along with me and say, here's another adventure for you. So that the adventures and the travel that she didn't get to experience in her life, she will now get to experience in death. You know, for me, it becomes full circle. So that's something my mother gave me. She gave me the love of adventure and travel. You know, and sometimes, you know, when I make my bed, I think of the envelope. Mal said, he said if the a man, if a man fails to reach the top of the wall, then he is not a man. So this keeps, that keeps me going because I'm going to go right to the shore, right to the end, and show him so that uh, as he's watching, he will see that I have then proven that I have become a man. I think one of the results of our trip, we hope, may be that uh, the walls that are erected uh, whether they are physical walls like this, or whether they are other walls of ideology or philosophy, uh, will not divide peoples in the world. Uh, that peoples, regardless of their differences in backgrounds and their philosophies, will have an opportunity to communicate with each, with each other, to know each other, uh, and to share with each other uh, those particular endeavors that will mean peaceful progress in the years ahead.